I left these wires deliberately long because I didn't know where on the surface of this board I wanted to mount the power supply, the switch, the, uh, the input probe and all the different stuff. So I left everything loose so that I could arrange it in an optimal configuration, which is still not actually completely arranged. We are going to have to work on a test rig that has shorter wires and it's understandable where those wires are going for people on the internet to understand. We don't want that. Why not? Why do I want people understanding my workbench? <laughs> That's for me to understand. <laughs> These terminal blocks we hooked up, basically you need a five volt source. You need an input source which tells the laser power supply how much power to put out. And that's, that can be either pulse width modulation or it can be direct variation of the voltage from a potentiometer. You need a ground and you need also a protection switch. All these laser supplies that I've dealt with so far have a sometimes label P and sometimes WP. And what that usually is meant for is a water flow meter or something else that you want to cut off the power supply if this condition is not met. So since we don't have a water flow meter on any of our machines, we ground that. And that basically bypasses that protection and allows the laser to fire. If TL goes to low, it will fire. Okay. I'm if TH ahead. goes to high, it'll fire. Okay. Yeah, okay. we're about to laze a piece of paper. Maybe. And then burn this place down. Baby steps. First the paper, then the house. Everybody stand free. <laughs> <laughs> We also have a high voltage probe and a calorimeter that is rated to display the output of a laser tube in watts. So the high voltage probe is just a voltage divider basically that allows us to measure a very high voltage and get a reading that will not blow up our meter. So the high voltage probe is used, it's basically a voltage divider that will reduce the voltage that is being read to something that will not blow our meter up. So this one runs by a factor of a thousand. So when we read 10 on the voltmeter, we're actually measuring 10,000 volts of potential difference. We use that because the power out output that is required to excite the gas in the tube is on the order of 9 to 10,000 volts. finger anywhere near the high tension lead because you know there is there is a, a dielectric coefficient for air I don't remember exactly what it is you know per unit volume but 10,000 volts will jump across a small amount of air and if you get too close and you're the closest circuit to ground it will jump across and bite you and Richard actually uh, shocked himself this morning oh he did yeah you know Rich, Richard's kind of weird so he's like it kind of felt good but not good you know <laughs> So the other instrument that we were using is basically a calorimeter, a device to measure heat. And in this case, what we want to know is how much power is being produced by the laser tube for a given input of electrical energy. So this is a black body that is calibrated to selectively absorb the wavelength of uh, radiation that's emitted by the laser, by CO2 and, and YAG lasers in particular. And the way it works is you apply heat to this surface for a set amount of time which is calibrated at the factory, and, and the, for this one it's 35 seconds. And then you allow an additional amount of time, which is also calibrated for the individual uh, instrument, which in this one is 25 seconds, for the heat to fully be absorbed. Watts are a measure of power, work done per unit time. So there's two, and that's why the time period in there is so important. And that 
actually causes movement, probably through a bimetallic strip inside there, of this needle the, on the gauge. And that actually reads directly in the output in watts, up to 100. By putting this at the output of the laser, the unfocused beam so that you get no hot spots but apply the heat as evenly as possible. Calculating how much input goes in in electrical energy, you can also uh, calculate the efficiency of your tube, which for CO2 lasers usually is, runs around 20%. We moved the tube to the front because it was uh, unbalanced when we applied pressure to the rear of the tube and we didn't want it to kick the beam away from the absorbing body of the uh, calorimeter, the watt meter. The portion where you see the needle climbing on the calorimeter was sped up considerably because who wants to wait 35 seconds? You've got other things to do. We wanted to cool it back down so that we could take the next reading without waiting. This was when we were reading the amperage off of the return side. So what I was noticing in this video that I had forgotten at the time was that when we tested the 40 watt tube and the 40 watt power supply of bins, I noticed that the voltage was more or less constant, whatever the setting of the potentiometer. In other words, if you think of the potentiometer as a uh, gas pedal, when I had the gas pedal floored, it was the same voltage as when I had my foot completely off the gas. What varied was the amperage, the return current, as the power output changed. When I tested an 80 watt, tube and an 80 watt power supply on the same test rig with the same equipment. What I noticed was when I had the potentiometer at full power, I had about 15,000 volts of input into the tube and the return current was 27 to 28 milliamps. And I measured the power output at 87 watts. When I brought the potentiometer down, the voltage actually increased from 15 to about 16.1 kilovolts. But the amperage came down from 27 to about 22 and the rated power was still at 83. And then when I brought the pedal all the way back to one volt, about one-fifth of the power output, the voltage went from 15 at full power all the way up to 22,000 volts. And the amperage came all the way down to six. So the voltage went up by about half, by about 50%, and the amperage dropped by about 75%. The power was, uh, obviously you were decreasing the power, but it was odd that both of these variables changed in the one instance and they didn't only one variable changed in the other. And we shouldn't rely on the potentiometer's reading to determine the, the amperage if you don't have an right. ammeter. Right. It's good to have an inline ammeter. Yeah. Yeah, don't rely on a potentiometer because a potentiometer has a percentage of tolerance and error. That's right. Not only that, it changes when you apply the power. Uh, ben was very appreciative of our efforts on his behalf. Uh, we, and I, I think we did go above and beyond, you know, what's, what would be required for a typical customer. But I enjoyed his company so much, I would like to uh, thank Ben for having come over and also for inviting us to his shop later, which we went to and had fun there too.